Welcome everyone to this enlightening roundtable discussion where we dive deep into the multifaceted aspects of Islam. Our distinguished panel brings a wealth of knowledge from a variety of religious and philosophical perspectives. Let's begin by having each of our panelists briefly introduce themselves. I'm Imam Ahmad al-Farsi. My work revolves around spreading a deeper understanding of Islam, promoting peace, and engaging in interfaith dialogues. It's crucial we address misconceptions and foster a spirit of tolerance. I'm Rabbi Sarah Levin. Beyond my role in guiding a vibrant Jewish congregation, I am committed to social justice and the Jewish principle of tikkun olam, or repairing the world, through the lens of our shared religious texts and traditions. Greetings, I'm Father Elijah. My devotion lies in exploring Christian theology and its practice in the modern world, especially in terms of love, compassion, and community service, and how it intersects with Islam. I'm Venerable Tichananda, a follower of Zen Buddhism. My focus is on mindfulness and compassion, a journey inward that I believe shares common ground with the essence of Islamic teachings, especially regarding peace and understanding. I am Swami Priyananda, a teacher of Hindu philosophy. The pursuit of truth and understanding through Vedanta mirrors, in many aspects, the quest found within Islam. It's these intersections of thought and spirituality I find most fascinating. Thank you, everyone. Our discussion today aims not only to enlighten, but also to challenge preconceptions. Let's delve into the history, principles, and contemporary issues faced by Islam and how it intersects with our diverse perspectives. We're not here to shy away from difficult topics, but to engage with them respectfully and thoughtfully. Let's start with our first segment. Let's delve into the historical emergence of Islam and its expansion across the Arabian Peninsula. Ahmad, could you provide us with an overview of this transformative period? Certainly. The Prophet Muhammad received revelations in the early 7th century, which marked the beginning of Islam. It rapidly spread due to its compelling message, strategic marriages, and military campaigns. Within a century, it had significantly impacted the Arabian Peninsula and beyond, reshaping social and political landscapes. I must add, from a Christian perspective, the emergence of Islam was initially met with suspicion and trepidation. However, historical interactions showcase a complex rapport, ranging from conflict to coexistence and intellectual exchange. Indeed, Elijah, the early interactions were complex. Yet, Islam's spread was not just through conquests. The appeal of its social justice principles played a crucial role offering a sense of equality and community. That's an important point, Ahmad. The social justice aspect resonates with the Judaic emphasis on justice and charity. However, it's fascinating to see how Islam incorporated these principles to aid its spread. It's noteworthy how these principles of justice and community parallels with Hindu notions of Dharma, especially in the context of building a cohesive society. The rapid spread of Islam also demonstrates the power of spiritual ideas in uniting diverse peoples. It's quite inspiring to see how a spiritual message can lead to vast movements across continents. Absolutely. And it's crucial to recognize that the spread of Islam led to significant cultural and scientific exchanges that benefited not just the Islamic world, but humanity as a whole. While acknowledging those benefits, it's also important to discuss the conflicts that arose. These historical conflicts have shaped a lot of today's interfaith dialogues and misunderstandings. True, conflicts did occur, but the period also saw Muslims, Christians, and Jews living together, particularly in places like Spain, contributing to a rich cultural and intellectual legacy. The key takeaway should be the ability of Islam, or any religion for that matter, to influence and be influenced by the existing cultures and societies it interacts with. The dynamic exchange is what's fascinating. Indeed, Sarah. This adaptive interplay between Islam and indigenous cultures it encountered underscores the fluidity and malleability of spiritual traditions when they intersect with different societal norms. This discussion beautifully highlights how the emergence and spread of Islam involve not only military conquests and strategic alliances, but also a deep engagement with pre-existing social, cultural, and religious norms. The complexity of this history is what enriches our understanding of Islam's place in the world today.
Moving forward, let's delve into the core of Islamic belief, the significance and interpretation of the Quran and Hadith. Ahmad, can you start us off by explaining these foundations? Certainly, Precious. The Quran, for Muslims, is the verbatim word of God as revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. It's not just a religious text, but a complete guide for life. The Hadith, on the other hand, are the sayings and actions of the Prophet Muhammad. They serve as a practical interpretation of the Quran. However, interpretation is where much diversity comes in. That's an important point, Ahmad. In Judaism, we similarly have the Torah and the Talmud. The Torah is our sacred text, while the Talmud interprets and expounds upon it. It's fascinating to see this parallel structure in our faiths. Absolutely, Sarah. The dialogue between these texts is vital. I find the reliance on prophetic tradition for interpretation quite interesting. Christianity has its Bible, which combines the Word of God with accounts of Jesus' life, making it slightly different in its compilation. Interesting comparisons all around. How then, Ahmad, does modern context affect the interpretation of these Islamic texts? Modern challenges require Muslims to continually engage with the Quran and Hadith to find guidance that addresses contemporary issues, from technological advances to social changes. It's a dynamic process, though not without its debates within the community. Dynamic is the word. In Judaism, the reinterpretation or new understanding of texts is commonplace. It sounds like Islam has a similar engagement with its sacred texts, constantly interpreting them in light of new contexts. Precisely, Sarah, and it's this fluidity that keeps our faith both relevant and vibrant. I appreciate the reverence given to sacred texts in both Islam and Judaism. In Hinduism, we view our sacred texts as eternal truths that also require contextual interpretation. This interpretive process is what keeps spiritual practice alive and significant. This interpretive aspect seems universal among our traditions. It's about finding the essence of these teachings and applying them meaningfully in our lives today. As we tackle interpretations and modern challenges, how do you navigate potential controversies that arise with traditional beliefs, Ahmad? It's about balance. Emphasizing the principles of justice, mercy, and peace found in the Quran helps address controversies. However, interpretation is complex and there are vigorous scholarly debates within the Islamic community. Not every interpretation will align, which is both the beauty and challenge of Islamic jurisprudence. That's a shared challenge in Christianity as well, interpreting ancient texts in a way that is relevant and respectful to modern believers. Sometimes, interpretations clash, leading to heated debates within our communities. True, Elijah. It underscores the importance of dialogue and scholarship. Dialogue and respectful disagreement can lead to a deeper understanding of our own beliefs. Judaism thrives on such debate. It's clear that interpretation is a vibrant, living process in all our traditions. This brings us to a close on this segment. The engagement with sacred texts is indeed complex and reflective of broader dialogues in society. Thank you all for your insights. Today, we delve into a topic that's widely discussed and often misunderstood, jihad. Ahmad, could you start us off by clarifying the historical context of jihad in Islam? Certainly. Jihad, in its essence, is a term that means striving or struggling in the way of God. Historically, it has been understood in many dimensions, including spiritual struggle against sin. However, it's often misrepresented in media as synonymous with terrorism, which is a gross distortion. I appreciate Ahmad's clarification. In Buddhism, we also have a concept of inner struggle, though it's more focused on overcoming personal desire and ignorance. The similarity lies in the internal fight against negative forces. That's an interesting parallel, Ananda. In Judaism, we speak about a struggle too, but it's more about wrestling with God's commandments and understanding one's role in the world. Ahmad, how does the concept of jihad address the collective and personal obligation? Sarah, that's an astute observation. Jihad is both a personal and collective duty. The greater jihad refers to the personal spiritual struggle, striving to lead a good Muslim life. The lesser jihad, often misconstrued, refers to the defense of the Islam community when threatened. It's about justice, not aggression. It seems then, the issue is more about misinterpretation rather than the concept itself. In Christianity, 
While we don't have a direct equivalent of jihad, we do understand the notion of spiritual warfare against sin and the devil. It's pivotal that we differentiate between the spiritual goal and the misuse of religious concepts for political gains. Exactly, Elijah. In Hinduism, the Bhagavad Gita discusses the moral struggle, the necessity to fight for righteousness. The key is the context, spiritual versus literal warfare. Ahmad's point highlights a common misunderstanding that escalates conflicts unnecessarily. And that's where education plays a crucial role. Understanding the true essence of concepts like jihad helps dismantle stereotypes and fosters a more nuanced conversation among different faiths. I must say, Ahmad, your explanation sheds light on the vast gap between the true Islamic teachings and the prevalent perception in Western media. It's a reminder of the importance of seeking knowledge directly from the source. This is where dialogue like ours becomes instrumental. By sharing and recognizing the depth of each other's traditions, we find common ground and dispel myths. Ahmad, your insights into jihad as a multifaceted concept are invaluable. Indeed, this conversation underscores the complexity of religious concepts and the dangers of oversimplification. Each of you, from your diverse religious backgrounds, has highlighted the importance of understanding and respect. Let's carry this ethos throughout our discussion, remembering the rich diversity and commonalities of our traditions. Let's delve into the core of daily Muslim life, the five pillars of Islam. Ahmad, can you start us off with a brief overview? Certainly. The five pillars of Islam constitute the framework of a Muslim's life. They are the declaration of faith, prayer, almsgiving, fasting during Ramadan, and pilgrimage to Mecca. These pillars are not merely rituals, but guide the ethical and spiritual base of a Muslim's life. It's interesting to note the parallels in Judaism with our practices like prayer, charity, and fasting. It highlights a shared foundation of ethical monotheism. I appreciate the depth in the concept of the pillars. In Hinduism, we have the concept of Dharma, which similarly guides one's duty in life promoting righteous living. Yes, and it's key to understand that these practices are meant to embed discipline and compassion in one's life. For example, fasting during Ramadan is not just abstention from food, but a time for spiritual reflection and increased charity. That's a profound point, Ahmed. In Buddhism, mindfulness and reflection are crucial as well. It's fascinating to see how the pillars encourage mindfulness among Muslims. The parallel in Christianity with Lent shares a similar purpose. It's interesting to see how fasting across religions aims to elevate the spiritual over the physical. However, one might argue that the rigid structure of the pillars could be seen as too prescriptive. How does this shape personal spiritual exploration within Islam? That's a valid point, Priyananda. However, Islam encourages personal reflection within this framework. The pillars provide a foundation but how one chooses to deepen their faith through these practices is a personal journey. I see that as akin to the Jewish practice of mitzvot. The commandments set a foundation, but there's room for personal interpretation and emphasis. Indeed, while Christianity might not have an exact counterpart to the five pillars, the emphasis on practices like prayer and charity is quite similar. It appears then that across our various faiths, there's a universal recognition of the importance of structured practice as a means to cultivate ethical, spiritual life. Despite our different paths, the goals seem remarkably aligned. The spirited nature of this discussion underscores the richness of religious practice and the common ground found in our commitments to spiritual growth and ethical living. Each faith brings a unique perspective to what it means to live a righteous life, providing invaluable insight into the universal quest for meaning and virtue. Moving on to a topic that is both complex and crucial in understanding Islam today, let's discuss the origins of the Sunni-Shia divide and its impact on both the global stage and within Muslim communities. Ahmad, could you start us off by explaining the historical origins of this divide? Certainly. The Sunni-Shia split originates from a dispute over the succession after the Prophet Muhammad's death. Sunnis believed that the Prophet's successor should be elected from among his close companions 
leading to the appointment of Abu Bakr as the first caliph. On the other hand, Shia Muslims held that leadership should stay within the Prophet's family, advocating Ali, his cousin and son-in-law, as the rightful successor. It's interesting how this mirrors the schisms within Christianity over the centuries. Despite the theological differences and historical conflicts, both Sunni and Shia Islam have rich traditions of scholarship and spiritual practice. That's a good point, Elijah. Like the divisions within Judaism over rabbinical authority and interpretation of the Torah, the Sunni-Shia divide reflects deep-rooted theological and political issues. However, it's crucial not to oversimplify or exaggerate these differences when discussing their impact on global politics and community relations. Absolutely, Sarah. And while theological differences exist, much of the conflict attributed to the Sunni-Shia divide is actually political, often exploited by external forces to further their own agendas. It's imperative to recognize the diversity within these traditions. Just as in Hinduism, diversity of thought and practice enriches the religion, it's about understanding and respecting these differences. Yes, and from a Buddhist perspective, the emphasis is on finding common ground in compassion and mindfulness. The Sunni-Shia divide, like any religious or ideological division, is an opportunity for dialogue and mutual understanding. How does this divide affect Muslims in their daily lives, especially in regions where the split is more pronounced? In some regions, it affects almost every aspect of life, from which mosque one prays in, to whom one can marry, and even one's social and political allegiances. But in many parts of the world, Sunnis and Shias live together in harmony, united by their shared faith. It's crucial, then, that outsiders do not perpetuate divisions by misunderstanding or misrepresenting these communities. The role of education and dialogue in healing and understanding cannot be overstated. And it's equally important for media portrayals to avoid sensationalizing the divide, which can exacerbate tensions and hinder the peace-building process. These perspectives shed light on the complexity of the Sunni-Shia divide and its significant impact beyond theological differences. It's a reminder of the need for nuanced understanding and respect in discussions about Islam. Let's move into a discussion that's often fraught with misunderstanding and controversy, Islamic jurisprudence, commonly known as Sharia law. Ahmad, can we start with you to clear some of the common misconceptions? Certainly. A widespread misconception is that Sharia law is a strict, monolithic system used to govern all aspects of a Muslim's life, which simply isn't true. It's a moral and legal framework that guides Muslims in personal, spiritual, and communal matters. And importantly, it's subject to interpretation and adaptation. That's an important clarification. It's somewhat parallel to Jewish halakha, which guides but also adapts to contexts and communities. It's crucial we understand religious laws aren't static, but are living, breathing parts of faith. Precisely, Sarah. Misconceptions lead to fear. Sharia, like Halakha, emphasizes justice, compassion, and mercy, values that are unfortunately overshadowed in media portrayals. But Ahmad, we must acknowledge the instances where Sharia law has been interpreted in ways that contradict our shared human values and rights. How do we reconcile this with the essence of Sharia you're describing? Elijah, that's a valid point. The issue there lies not in Sharia itself, but in human interpretation and application. Like any religious or legal system, extremism and political agendas can distort the foundational principles of justice and compassion. Indeed, it's a universal challenge. In Hinduism, we have ancient texts that are sometimes interpreted in rigid ways. The key is evolving interpretation to meet contemporary values while retaining spiritual integrity. This discussion underscores the importance of interfaith dialogue. Understanding the core values behind these systems, compassion, justice, mercy, can bridge gaps of misunderstanding. Ahmad, how do you see reform or evolution within the framework of Sharia to address human rights concerns, especially regarding women and minorities? Sarah, there's a dynamic conversation within Islam around these issues. Progressive scholars and activists are using the very tools of ijtihad interpretative reasoning to advocate for interpretations that fully uphold human dignity and rights, which the Quran supports. It's heartening to hear about progressive movements within Islam. 
Continuous interpretation is key in Christianity as well, ensuring the teachings remain relevant and compassionate. It seems the crux of our discussion on Sharia, or religious law in any tradition, centers around interpretation, application, and the ever-present need for dialogue, both within and across faiths. Would everyone agree? Absolutely. Dialogue, education, and the willingness to question and understand are vital. It's through conversations like these we realize the more we learn, the more we find common ground. And that common ground allows us to navigate our differences with respect and empathy, promoting a more inclusive understanding and application of religious principles. Precisely why interfaith dialogues are essential. By learning from each other, we can challenge misconceptions and grow in mutual respect. Thanks to each of you for a thoughtful and enlightening discussion. It's clear that knowledge, dialogue, and an open heart are key tools in navigating the complexities of religious jurisprudence. Let's delve into the mystical aspect of Islam, Sufism. Ahmad, could you start us off with an overview? Certainly. Sufism, often referred to as the inner mystical dimension of Islam, focuses on the purification of the inner self, aiming to achieve a direct experience of God's divine love. It's not separate from Islam, but rather a deeper practice of it, emphasizing personal spirituality over external rituals. That sounds remarkably similar to the Jewish mystical tradition of Kabbalah, which also seeks a closer personal connection with the divine. Indeed, both traditions emphasize the heart's transformation as a path to experiencing the divine. In Buddhism, we have a similar concept in our meditation practices, which aim to develop insights into the nature of reality and achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. It's fascinating to see how Sufism integrates practices similar to meditation, focusing on remembrance of God, known as Dikr, which realigns the heart towards the divine. This mirrors the Hindu practice of Japa, the repetition of God's name to maintain a constant awareness of the divine presence. Exactly, Priyananda. However, it's crucial to understand that Sufism has faced criticism and even persecution within Islam itself for its unorthodox practices and beliefs, which some interpret as straying from the purity of Islamic teachings. Christianity has its own form of mysticism, with figures like St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. These mystics emphasized an experiential relationship with God, often at odds with the established church. Ahmad, you mentioned persecution. It's a poignant nod to the challenges faced by mystics in many traditions who seek direct, personal engagement with the divine, often challenging institutional norms and interpretations. Precisely, Ananda. And yet Sufism has contributed greatly to Islamic art, poetry, and music, enriching the Islamic tradition with its emphasis on love and the unity of all existence under God. It's this universal approach to love and unity that resonates across all our traditions. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a prominent Jewish thinker, spoke about the ineffable, the paradox, much like the Sufi poets Rumi and Hafiz, who transcend religious boundaries with their universal appeal. This universal appeal is what drives so much of the world's spiritual inquiry. The essence of what Sufism reaches for, direct experience of the divine, is mirrored in the Hindu pursuit of moksha, liberation from the cycle of birth and death, achieved through personal realization of the divine. It's refreshing to witness how each of our traditions acknowledges a path towards understanding and experiencing the divine that transcends ritualistic practice. It speaks to a fundamental human longing for connection with something greater than ourselves. The richness of Sufism and its parallels in other mystical traditions highlights the diversity within Islam and the shared spiritual quests across religions. It's a potent reminder of the common ground we share in our journey towards understanding the divine. Let's keep that spirit of shared inquiry as we move to our next topic. Let's delve into the role of women in Islam. This is a topic rife with misconceptions and differing viewpoints. Ahmad, could you kick us off by clarifying the rights and roles of women as outlined in the Quran and Hadith? Certainly. Islam, through the Quran and Hadith, provided rights to women over 1400 years ago that were revolutionary. Property ownership, inheritance, education, and the right to work 
were all given to women by Islamic law. It's critical to understand these rights were granted in a time when such concepts were virtually unheard of elsewhere. That's a commendable point, Ahmad. In Judaism, we also see a progression of women's roles and rights. However, it's the interpretation and application in contemporary settings that often lead to debates. How do you see the implementation of these rights in today's Muslim communities? It varies significantly, Sarah. While the laws are clear, cultural practices often overshadow religious mandates. It's an issue of education and social reform to align current practices with the original teachings of Islam regarding women's rights. I find this an interesting parallel to Hinduism, where cultural practices often influence the interpretation of religious texts. The challenge, as I see it, lies not in the religious teachings themselves, but in their interpretation and application by society. A vital point, Priyananda. Ahmad, controversies surrounding gender equality and women's rights in Islam often spark heated debates. How do you address these controversies? By going back to the sources. Many argue that Islam restricts women, but when you read the Quran and Hadith, you see numerous instances where women's rights are advocated. The Prophet Muhammad himself worked for his wife Khadija, who was a successful businesswoman. This demonstrates Islam's support for women's economic independence and leadership. But Ahmad, how do you reconcile this with reports of gender-based restrictions in various Muslim-majority countries? Elijah, that's a fair question. It's crucial to distinguish between cultural practices and Islam's teachings. Many of these restrictions are culturally rooted, not religiously. Islam advocates for justice, equity, and respect for women, which is often lost in cultural interpretation. Indeed, Ahmad. From a Buddhist perspective, we also emphasize compassion and equality. It seems that across our traditions, the core values align, yet the practical application can sometimes diverge from these principles. Let's talk about the movement towards equality and changing perceptions. Sarah, as a woman in a religious leadership role, how do you view this evolution? It's an ongoing journey, Precious. Similar to Islam, Judaism has seen a transformation in women's roles, particularly in religious leadership. It's about challenging long-standing interpretations and advocating for change that aligns with our core values of justice and equality. I respect that, Sarah. It's the same within Islam. The more we educate and engage with our texts, the stronger the movement towards truly implementing the rights Islam has given to women. This discussion highlights the importance of education and dialogue in challenging misconceptions and advocating for gender equality. Each of your traditions offers unique perspectives on this continuous journey. Thank you for a thorough and enlightening conversation. Let's dive into our discussion on the relationship between Islam and other Abrahamic religions, specifically Christianity and Judaism. Ahmad, could you start us off with the Islamic perspective on this relationship? Certainly. Islam sees itself as part of the same monotheistic tradition as Judaism and Christianity. The Quran speaks respectfully of people of the book, a term which encompasses both Jews and Christians. It's a complex relationship, historically interwoven with both cooperation and conflict, but the theological underpinnings within Islam emphasize respect and shared lineage. I appreciate your pointing that out, Ahmad. In Judaism, we have a similar acknowledgement of our shared roots. Historical interactions have been varied, but at the core, there's a mutual recognition of a monotheistic tradition. The Jewish perspective values ethical monotheism, and there's a deep respect for the ethical teachings found in Islam and Christianity alike. That's a very important point, Sarah. Christianity, originating from Judaism and sharing much with Islam, has a varied history in its relationship with both. While we acknowledge our shared Abrahamic roots, it's undeniable that we've also seen centuries of tension and conflict. However, in dialogue, we find that the foundational values of love, compassion, and justice are profoundly shared across our faiths. Elijah, while I agree on the shared values, it's vital to address how political and social contexts have often skewed these relationships. Too often, the essence of our teachings is overshadowed by conflict. Exactly, Ahmad, it's not our faiths but our historical and political situations that often divide us. Judaism teaches the pursuit of peace above all, 
and dialogues like this can bridge those divides created by misunderstanding or politics. If I may add from a Buddhist perspective, it's fascinating to see the convergence on values like compassion and peace in your traditions. It underscores a universal quest for understanding and coexistence, doesn't it? It does, Ananda. Now, Ahmad mentioned the term people of the book. Elijah, how does Christianity interpret this connection, especially given the historical crusades and conflicts? Precious. It's a critical reflection point for Christianity. The Crusades are a regrettable chapter in our history, and contemporary Christianity largely views them as a distortion of Jesus' teachings on love and neighborliness. Today, there's a much stronger emphasis on understanding and respecting our shared beliefs, promoting peace rather than conflict. And yet, it's important not to gloss over history, but to learn from it. The challenges we face today, extremism and tolerance, aren't new. They're deeply rooted in our shared history. Acknowledging this is the first step toward genuine understanding and coexistence. Ahmad raises an excellent point. Our shared history is a mixed tapestry, but it offers us lessons on how to build a more tolerant and understanding future. The dialogues between our communities today are testament to our commitment to this future. Thank you, everyone, for this rich discussion. It's clear that despite the complexities of historical interactions, there's a strong foundation for mutual respect and understanding, grounded in shared values. Our dialogue underscores the importance of focusing on these shared values to promote peace and mutual respect. Welcome back. We're moving into a discussion that touches the very heart of contemporary global concerns navigating modernity, extremism, and reform movements within Islam. Ahmad, please lead us into this delicate topic. Thank you, Precious. Islam, like any major world religion, faces the challenge of interpreting age-old teachings in the context of an ever-evolving world. We're confronted with the task of distinguishing between cultural practices that have become intertwined with religious beliefs and the core principles of Islam, which advocate peace, justice, and tolerance. Ahmad, that's a crucial point. In Judaism, we face similar challenges. It's about the balance between tradition and the need for progress, and how sometimes external perceptions can overshadow the nuanced reality of practice and belief. The misconception of extremism as a core part of Islam is a significant issue. While Buddhism emphasizes a path of non-attachment and peace, it too has been misrepresented. Ahmad, how can Islam address these misconceptions effectively? Ananda, it's about education, dialogue, and the courage to challenge both internal and external stereotypes. Extremism isn't born from religion itself, but from a perversion of its teachings. Improving literacy, offering platforms for open dialogue, and encouraging critical engagement with our own beliefs are keys to navigating these challenges. Indeed, Ahmad. Hinduism also emphasizes the power of understanding and dialogue. The Vedas teach us that truth is one, but the wise express it in a variety of ways. Perhaps Islam's future lies in embracing the diversity of interpretation within its own teachings. That's an essential point, Priyananda. Within Christianity, we've had our own divisions and debates on interpretation and practice. Ahmad, regarding reform movements within Islam, how do they contribute to addressing these challenges? Reform movements are crucial. They stimulate necessary introspection and debate within the community. However, it's not just about reforming, it's about returning to the essence of Islam, compassion, mercy, and common humanity. These movements encourage a reflection on our practices and beliefs, guiding us to apply the principles of our faith in ways that honor our tradition while embracing the present. It sounds like a tightrope walk between preservation and progress. True, Sarah. It's a journey similar to the Buddhist middle way, avoiding extremes and finding a harmonious balance. This discussion highlights the complex interplay between tradition and modernity within Islam, and frankly, all religions. Acknowledging the need for continuous dialogue, education, and the confronting of stereotypes seems to be a shared foundation. Let's carry these insights into our final thoughts. Thank you, everyone, for such a profound and insightful discussion. 
As we draw to a close, I'd like each of you to reflect on today's conversation and share your takeaways about Islam, the misconceptions, and the truths we've delved into. Ahmad, let's start with you. Today's dialogue has been enlightening. One point that resonated with me came from Sarah about the shared values across our Abrahamic traditions. It's crucial to emphasize that Islam, like Judaism and Christianity, teaches compassion and justice. Yet I must assert that the portrayal of Sharia in Western media remains vastly misunderstood, simplifying a complex system into stereotypical misconceptions. Ahmad, you're quite right about the oversimplifications. It's something we see with Jewish halakha too. I appreciated your explanation on Sharia, which mirrors many aspects of halakha. The misconceptions around it are quite similar. What struck me most today, however, was our discussion on women in Islam. It's a testament to the diversity of interpretation within Islamic jurisprudence, akin to the debates we have within Judaism over textual interpretations. In our various exchanges, the comparison between the pillars of Islam and the concepts in Hinduism highlighted for me the universal pursuit of a disciplined, spiritually aligned life. However, I must express that the notion of jihad, as explained by Ahmad, is often taken out of context, leading to a skewed perception of Islam that does not represent its true essence. Absolutely, the misunderstanding of jihad is a significant issue. Ahmad's explanation was insightful, offering clarity on a topic that's widely misconstrued. My takeaway is the depth of Sufism and its parallels with Buddhist practices. It underscores the mystic unity that can serve as a bridge between different faiths. Yet, I sensed resistance when I mentioned that nonviolence in Buddhism parallels the true spirit of jihad. This resistance opens doors for deeper interfaith dialogues. Ahmad's elucidation of the Sunni and Shia divide and its historical context was particularly informative. It's essential to recognize how such distinctions shape not just internal Islamic relations, but also global politics. Comparing it to denominational divides in Christianity, it's clear that every major faith tradition faces challenges in unity and interpretation. However, Ahmad, while I appreciate the complexities of Sharia, I believe more dialogue is needed to bridge the gap of understanding, especially regarding its application in non-Muslim countries. Elijah, your point is well taken. The discussion on Sharia indeed demands a more nuanced approach, recognizing its varied application across different Muslim-majority countries. This roundtable has once again affirmed the need for continuous dialogue and education to dispel ignorance. Thank you all. This conversation, though at times heated, underlines the importance of engaging with and understanding Islam beyond stereotypes. Our discussions today reflect the rich, complex nature of a faith practiced by over a billion people worldwide. By acknowledging our differences and seeking common ground, we pave the way for a more tolerant and inclusive world.